Hello, hello, hello. This is Sean Jackson from the PlayStation Podcast, your podcast, your place for creative people and all people who love pottery, sculpture, slab building, and all things ceramic. My name is Sean Jackson, your host, and we have a very special guest artist here on the show today. Her name is, if I can pronounce it correctly, Dana Lundmark. Welcome to the show. Hi, Sean. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. And since it's been so long, I really appreciate you um, getting back in contact and us having a good old yarn again here on here on the show. It's really good to see you and to hear from you. Um, what we might do first, we might look go into a bit in your background, um, or actually before that, um, we're just having a yarn about what you're doing now. So if if you wanted to um, let people know about what's happening at the moment. You started talking about this new gallery you're starting to work on. Absolutely. Um, Very exciting. Three other members and I have just gone into this new adventure. We've got a gallery that's opening up soon with studios. Now, the name, Sean, please don't laugh too loudly. I won't. Crackpot, Crackpot Studios and Gallery. Oh, that sounds like a good one. Yeah. So, um and we are at the moment setting it all up, getting our desks in, trying to get plinths and so on. Hopefully it will be open, you know, very, very shortly. It's in Freshwater in Sydney. Um, gallery space, studio space, we're hoping to have workshops. And because some of us are drawers from beginning and artists in that field, um, I personally will be having live drawing classes as well as um, doing hand building and so on. Um, other members will also be doing workshops in wheel throwing and hand building. So very exciting, very, very exciting. So with the space, is a space split between like a studio space and a exhibition space? Yes, absolutely. That's one of the things that we wanted to do. We wanted to have a dedicated gallery, dedicated gallery so that it's there all the time. We wanted to have something on the northern beaches because there isn't very much here. So it's really to have a gallery for the local artists as well. I mean, we like to invite artists from all over, but mainly so that local artists have somewhere to show their work. Um, At the moment, we're just working on the plans, but we're hoping to have regular exhibitions of invited artists and um, also then lease the uh, space to other people that wanted to have a space to show. So, yeah. That's awesome that you've actually um, seen that there's some sort of need and you're developing something that there's a need of the community and within the um, industry in that area. And it's good that you're able to tackle this problem and approach it and I'm sure it'll do well because you've already identified the issues there to, to work around. Thank you. We Well, because there are four of us, I think we've all just uh, been able to communicate and explain what we want to do and the way we want to handle it in the community. Our other aim is to give back to the community because we have, we're all four of us are very passionate about ceramics and we want to give back. So we will probably also eventually when we have it organised be giving free classes to Um, members in the community that can't afford to go to ceramics classes. It's just something that um, to us it makes sense because, as you know, ceramics can give you so much. There's there's so much touching clay. Mm. It's just such a wonderful way to experience everything. So, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're very passionate about it and we just, there's a lot of effort involved and a lot of risk um, and investment, but, we're hoping that it's going to work. Awesome. So that location, again, is in the northern beaches? It's in Freshwater. So I might as well give you the address. You're one of the first <laughs> to know about it because we only got the keys on Monday. Awesome. It's uh, awesome. 20 Lawrence Street, Freshwater. So it's um, not far from Manly, DY. Um, it's a beautiful location and it's a uh, shop front. So, yes, we are really looking forward to it. Beautiful. I, I truly wish the best of luck, uh, and I'm I'm sh- I'm sure I have no doubts that it, it will definitely um, be a bustling centre for ceramics. I'm sure of it. Oh, thank you, Sean. That's really kind of you. With the, with this area, um, did you 
where you are now, did you grow, grow up in this area or are you, uh, I'm not even sure where your origins come from. <laughs> okay. So the name is confusing, isn't it? Oh, definitely. Two very different, <laughs> two very different names. I, Dana is actually Macedonian, ex-Yugoslavia. Nice. So I was born in Macedonia. Lundmark is Swedish. That's my husband's name. So very, very different. Um, but I came out to Australia when I was very young. So I regard myself as a Macedonian-born Australian. I grew up here. Northern Beaches, I've been living here for about 25 years. So that's quite a long time. Um, love living. I actually live in Manly. Love Manly and enjoy it very much. Are you a very proud Macedonian? Because um, the, the reason I ask is that I have one friend in Brisbane and he's Macedonian and he's very culturally, um, uh, what's the right word? He's very, he's very, um, he's very full Macedonian. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I would have to say I'm proud of my heritage, but I'm not very aware of it because I married a Swede, so... Um, I lost a lot of the contact with the Macedonians. And when we came to Australia, the Macedonian community was very small, very, very small. Um, and it's still not a huge community. Um, so I would have to say proud of the heritage. Um, a little bit ashamed that I'm not totally versed in a lot of the ways of the Macedonian way. But... Um, being married to someone who's not Macedonian changes it in so far that you don't stay with the community. You're outside the community. If that, if that kind of answers your question. No, you're right. You're right. There's no, there's no wrong answers here. I'm sure of it. <laughs> uh, so before you were married, uh, your background, say your childhood, was that in Macedonia or did you grow up in another country? No, here. I actually, I was eight when we came here, so my my childhood was here. Nice, nice. So you would have had a very strong uh, Aussie upbringing, I can imagine. Um, well, not really, because my parents spoke Macedonian. When we came out here, nobody spoke English, so I didn't speak English. Learned, learned that very quickly in school. My father was very determined for us to speak English, so he also took I have a brother, an older brother, so we all went to night classes, believe it or not, much to our disgust. We wanted to stay home and watch television, but my father said, no, 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 English is first. Um, those days when we came to Australia, it was assimilation. It wasn't a multicultural society. So mm. things were a little different. Um, you really did need to learn to speak English, and I think um, a lot of people felt that well, I believe that if you live in a country, you really must learn that language. That's my belief. Um, so we we kind of did that really quickly. But definitely Macedonian at home. Um, I, sp I still speak Macedonian. I write Macedonian. Uh, even though I was eight when we came out here, I probably had just one year of school in Macedonia. My father insisted that we, we learn to write and read. He taught us that himself. Mm. Well, it's good to have um, at least a connection to that, even even uh, whether it's strong or weak, it doesn't really matter as long as there's some connection there. And, and it's good to see that you're able to have that. Uh, do, do you feel um, your family, because um, yourself being um, an artist, do you feel your family, either your uh, siblings or your either of your parents had some uh, artistic... Um, uh, divergence, <laughs> some, some, um, uh, do you feel that you I were connected through an artistic skill? I'm really not sure about going back too far because I didn't know my grandparents and we didn't know, they died quite young. My parents, it's hard to know. Um, my brother is definitely artistically talented. He draws beautifully. He's an architect. And I remember very early on um, I admired him immensely because he used to enter these drawings in competitions. I remember one was a Commonwealth Bank and he won the prize. So um, I thought, okay, but I used to draw as well when I was little. 
Um, that's about the only connection I can make at this stage, but who knows what was back there. Okay, that's, that's good. I'm sorry, there's just a helicopter going overhead. <laughs> I live right next to a helicopter pad. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, okay, interesting. Uh, well, it's good to see that there was some uh, influence of um, artistic uh, family relatives. And uh, were you interested in art as a child or, or within your teen years, like at school? How, how do you feel that um, you started to get some, at what point do you feel you started feeling an attraction to uh, learning about art? Very early on, I took art as a selective from first year in high school. And I remember having my first art teacher and that was, I remember her so clearly, Marilyn Buzo was her name. And just a fantastic woman and was really inspirational and she encouraged me a lot. And I, at the age of 15, I think I did a massive painting and entered it in a local competition. I was kind of chuffed when they hung it. Um, and just and then did, did art all the way through to HSC and I did first level art at the HSC. Had the best teacher ever, Robin Gordon. She is um, herself an artist extremely well-known artist and jewellery maker, printmaker. She's, she, so she was a, a, a real force in my being inspired to continue. So definitely uh, wanted to do art all along. Um, there was something always there, but um, my father and mother had different ideas. So they, I had to go to university. There was no choice because my brother had already set that pathway and I, art school was not an option, to be honest. So I had to go to uni first. <laughs> what, what were their options on the table? Um, university, university, university. So um, I just thought, okay, well, I'll go to university. And I ended up um, studying Russian literature and Russian language at university. Wow. That and must have been after beautiful. I finished, I went to Russia for a year on a scholarship. Again, not something I had planned, but I have always painted. So all along I've been painting and drawing. And then um, even in Russia I, I was painting and drawing. And it was only later when I came back and um, did other things that I decided, okay, I have to get some formal training. And that's when I went and did fine arts. Um, so that's the path. It, it was a long round path, but it made my mum and dad happy. <laughs> As long as everyone's happy, it sounds it sounds good. But uh, that's amazing. You went over to Russia. I didn't. I didn't real. I know you've done a lot of travel overseas, but I didn't know Russia was on the on the, on the table. Um, what was it like in Russia? Did you did you from? I, I have no experience in Russia, but the only thing that I I, I imagine is a very cold place. <laughs> well, you know, we're talking um, Soviet Union time. Right. So we're not really talking, it was in the Soviet Union time, so we're talking the 70s now, and or late 70s, I should, no, not that old, you know, but late 70s um, in Russia. It was very, very, very different. I My intention was to go, and I was doing my master's, and I was doing my master's on a Russian film director and a writer, Shukshin. And for me, that was really exciting. I was, a, I was a uni student. I was interested in literature. That's been a passion as well. I wanted to read Russian novels in their original language, you know, quite an idealist and a dreamer. And um, it was just very eye-opening for me. I, um, I found myself there not really knowing to, what to expect. Ended up in a tiny place in south of um, Russia called Voronezh, which was a university city. A um, lot of foreigners, a lot of English um, students, lots of French. Well, that's where I met my husband, Swedes, um, and just from all different countries. They call us. They called us the capitalists. We all lived in dormitories with Russians. Um, amazing time, amazing time. Learned lots. Appreciated just how different everyone is, and how much you can get from meeting other people, particularly in different cultures. We were very limited in many ways. We could, we had a boundary of 30 kilometres. We were not allowed outside that 30 kilometres. But 
some of us did break it. I was one of them. Um, snuck out and did some naughty things. But it was, look, it was a, an incredible time in my life. And having met my husband there, um, it was one of the best times in my life. That sounds amazing. <laughs> I noticed um, on your resume you also spent some time in Poland. Uh, tell me about that story. Poland is, again, um, I've been interested in art in a very general term. So just to backtrack a little, so I, I majored in drawing in when I did fine arts and then I was very interested in design. I went to Florence and did jewellery design for a while I love making jewellery, but I found that it was very, very taxing and expensive. And then I also love icon painting. I think icons are beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So I went to Poland to work with a restorer for some time, an amazing um, restorer. So I spent um, daily, um, a few hours every day with him. He was showing me how to paint icons how he restored. One of the most beautiful things was that he was like a monk himself. He lived in this attic in, uh, in Poland and it was in Krakow, in this tiny attic, and it was covered with 15th century icons all over the floor. I was allowed to touch these things. You know, it was just, it was incredible. I just, I still can't believe that I, I was able to do that. I was able to experience all of that. Very, very generous man. Um, sent me home to Australia after a, a time with him with boxes full of pigments. I, I love those um, <gasps> Russian uh, iconistic uh, paintings. Uh, I've had a couple of uh, experiences of going into uh, Russian Orthodox churches and seeing the traditional um, uh, I icon uh, paintings and, and the amount of craftsmanship in them is absolutely beautiful. And uh, and actually, uh, for people listening, you can actually see that uh, Dana's uh, uh, drawings and ceramics and paintings on her website, which is uh, dana lundmark dot com. Um, and I, I've seen some of your paintings on your website as well, and that they're very beautiful as well. Were they? Um, used with uh, a gold gilding process. So how did you go about, um, what sort of process is involved with that? Okay, so I the traditional is you mix your uh, pigments with egg. It's egg tempera. So you, you go back. So I was lucky enough to be taught the traditional way. It's a very slow method because it's coating on some of those icons, I would have done 15 layers, very fine, very fine layers. And then it's actually 24 karat gold leaf. The gold is 24 karat gold um, applied with, um, there is a few different methods, but these days a lot of people use the Japanese gold size to apply that. Um, traditional method is very complex. I, ha I have done it, but uh, I don't do that very often because it just takes so long. But the actual process, the, um, it is a very medita meditative um, process. It's very slow and, and I just think they are, I also think they are beautiful. I think icons are really beautiful. Definitely a treasured part of uh, cultural treasures and cultural histories that are uh, well worth recording, uh, definitely. Um, now, uh, you've also had some experience over in Paris. Tell us a bit about that. Well, you have done your research. Um, for quite a long time, I was really lucky that when I finished my fine arts, one of my teachers suggested that the place I should go to is Paris. And I said, sure, why not? But I, I really couldn't afford it. I mean, what, what a nice thing for a teacher to say you should go to Paris. And then I said to him, look, I could probably scrape up the the uh, airfare, but to be able to get accommodation, it would be almost impossible. And he was very, very kind and offered me his um, place. He had a little place in Paris and he said, if you can get your airfare, I can get that for you. As it turned out, I couldn't stay with him because he and his wife were going to be there that summer, but he got me another studio. And um, I fell in love with the owners of this studio. And fortunately, they felt the same about me. 
and we've had a 30-year relationship of my going to Paris um, every now and then, and I spent a lot of time painting, and I did a whole series of Paris rooftops. I had a solo exhibition of Paris rooftops. I, I'm assuming that's what you're referring to. Yes, yes. Quite yeah. some time ago. Nice, nice. Uh, are you, you, do, you, do you speak a little bit of French? A little bit of French, but I, I speak a lot better in the other languages. <laughs> awesome. Um, now, going back to um, education and um, learning things, uh, you've done, just for people listening um, from your resume, uh, you've done a diploma in fine arts. You've do- also done a diploma in ceramics. And you've also done a diploma in advanced ceramics. Now, how do you feel, uh, what sort of differences did you see or feel between a diploma in fine arts and a diploma in ceramics, for example? Um, I think when I did the diploma in fine arts, I majored in drawing. So I was because I'm passionate about drawing, For me, it was something that I concentrated on enormously. At that stage, I never imagined that I would be doing sculpture or ceramics. So I knew nothing about ceramics. In fact, to be very honest, I knew nothing about ceramics until six years ago. It didn't exist for me. Um, Art for me meant paintings, which is so wrong, so, so wrong. I actually feel bad about that now, but um, it wasn't. It was always art meant something on the wall. And it certainly, ceramics didn't come into it. And now that I've been involved in ceramics for six years, I can't believe that ceramics takes a second seat, if you like, a back seat to painting. I just think, and now back to our gallery, one of the other reasons for having this gallery is that I think that ceramics has to stand up. We have to stand up and shout and say, we are great. Ceramics is equal up there. Um, We need to get that out there. We have to make sure that people recognise ceramics as an amazing art form and it's just as important as paintings. Um, You yourself are aware, of course I know, because your wife is Japanese and you've spent a lot of time in Japan, They value ceramics very differently to the Western world, particularly in Australia. We're not that aware. We don't seem to know where to put ceramics in our house unless it's a cup. I'm sorry, I could be wrong here. No, no, you're right. I just, I agree with you 100%. So for me, one of the reasons that I, I love being involved in this new gallery is because I feel I want to stand up and shout and say, look, ceramics are here. They are important. Um, they are just as valuable and makes me very sad. And I'm a paint, I mean, I'm a, I'm a painter from way back. So for me to say this is it's um, something that I've obviously thought about a lot. So when I go to an exhibition and Musselbrook is a, is a good example, and I just think Musselbrook uh, Art Prize, which is on at the moment, and I think it's a wonderful art prize. Um, I'm lucky to have been one of 12 ceramic artist to be a finalist there I went to the opening night but what was very sad for me was that the prize for the painting was 50,000 the prize for the ceramics was 10,000 so not exactly equal if you know what I mean so I'd like there to be a bit more equality in recognition of ceramics Um, major galleries I'd like to see them step up to the mark and you know people like us Pushing that a little more. Yeah, definitely in the Western world, um, socially, it's still not quite matured yet in terms of its uh, depth of understanding um, of its cultural and its uh, uh, applications within society. But um, it, it's definitely getting there. The, the, the fine arts world is advancing, but it's, yeah, as, as you've just said it it's not there 100 percent, but um it, it, it is slowly getting there we just gotta be patient i guess 
I agree. I agree. It's definitely getting there because I think there are more and more people aware that ceramics exists and more and more people are aware of what's involved in the process of ceramics. Mm -hmm. I mean, the techniques one needs to create beautiful work, um, it's enormous. It's absolutely enormous. Definitely, 100%. Um, with your work, again, your um, now from our discussion, we've seen a shift between focusing 100% on like drawing and painting or two-dimensionally, and then there's a shift going towards ceramics. Uh, at what point did you feel that there was that shift and – uh, have you gone full time into ceramics, uh, and at what point did you go full time? I don't know that I can say full time in ceramics. I would say what I have done is I was introduced to ceramics by sheer coincidence. Someone gave me some clay um, at a party where they offered cake and champagne, and I said, "Okay, I'll be there." And they gave me some clay, and I built a little person just on the spot, and I thought wow, I love this. And that's how I, I came across clay. I would say that I probably use clay like a 3D canvas. That would be my way. I will never stop drawing. I will always continue to draw. So I do draw on my vessels. Uh, I make people that I attach to my vessels. Um, so I... I I think that's probably the best way I can describe it. I mean, I, I will always I will always draw and paint, um, but all I've done is I've just taken it a step further and introduced it onto clay to a 3D surface rather than a flat surface. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, with your your work, like have you, as you said, uh, you, you make a lot of little figures and, and that sort of stuff. Um, I don't know, I'm sure that you're aware of this, but, uh, your work, um, it plays a lot between, from what I read of it, it plays a lot between, uh, positive and negative spaces from what I read. Do you feel that or how do you interpret your own, uh, artwork? Do, do you feel that there's a continual theme somewhere? How would you ex explain or identify your art style uh, to the audience? Um, wow, that's a tricky one, that one. Uh, one of my teachers has said that my work is recognisable. So whenever they saw it on the kill shelves, and I often forgot to sign it, and they say, it's all right, Dana, we know it's yours. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was a positive or a negative comment, to be honest with you. But um, I, um, I do like space. And you're right, the negative and the positive is important. So when I am attaching figures to a piece, I am very careful of where they go and aware of um, shadow and light, all of that playing against each other. Um, a style, I, I am probably the sort of person that likes to work in many different things. So I like colour, but I also love the purity of um, the porcelain clay. So often... Um, I will just have pure porcelain clay um, with maybe a, some some drawing on it or some um, etching or some attachment. So to be honest, um, I like to play with everything. Nice. Well, it's good to hear it from your, your perspective because uh, <laughs> everyone tends to read things differently. <laughs> uh, with uh, opportunities, um, I know... Uh, you're quite active in um, different um, exhibitions and stuff like that. Uh, do you actively seek out opportunities or do you sort of stay within a, a circle group of people and just uh, wait until you hear things come out? How, do you, how are you, um, uh, how to say? How? I, I know what you're asking. <laughs> um I'm glad well, see, you can read my mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I know where you're going with this. Um, the thing is that when I was painting, I was regularly exhibited in um, certain um, fields. I'm a portrait painter as well. So I had a lot of my portraits in the Porsche Geish Awards, and, um, which meant that I was aware of competitions. But And I think that I didn't know 
and I still feel I don't know a lot about the ceramics world. Um, people mention names and I don't know them and I feel a little bit embarrassed at times. I'm trying to learn um, ceramic uh, names and people that are well known in the field. It takes some time. I mean, I'm, I, I'm well versed with um, the art world and painters, but in the ceramics field, I am a little naive. And so I think we're, when I won the first, when I was a student and I won that student hand forming award, that was like a big opening for me. And, um, and then I thought, oh, and I actually was told about that competition. I didn't know about it. And I had no intentions of entering because I thought, oh, there's no way. I mean, I've only been doing ceramics for a year and a half. Why would I put something in? So that was a really nice boost for me. And, and it's a, it was a wonderful validation to say, go ahead and, and, and be brave. And then after that, um, there were some people that were telling me and sending me information. So it was more like people were sending me information saying, look, there's this competition. Um, you know, maybe you should enter something in there. And, and I did. And that's how it, ha- that's how it all evolved. Yes, yes. Do you feel that things are continuing to evolve through what you're doing now with the um, this new gallery and studio that's opening up? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that um, there will be a new direction in um, probably not as much making as I would do without this, but um, involvement with the community and involvement with these three other artists. So... And I think that when you're working closely in in a studio space with three other people, you probably influence each other in some ways. So I'm I'm excited about where where it's going to go in terms of my work as well. Um, What I'm doing at the moment, I've I've taken a little bit of a new direction. I'm trying to, and this is something we talked about, I'm trying to draw with um, Limoges Slip. I know it sounds a what bit silly. What is Limoges but, Slip? <laughs> That's one well, thing I haven't I'm, heard about. <laughs> but no, I mean, it's what, what I'm doing. I have a piece I can show you. Um, would Can I show you You're what welcome. I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, sure. Okay. So I'm trying to draw with Limoges Slip. So here's a piece. I'm not sure if you can see it. Yes. So if you, th- this is based on the Gia Cometti, one of my all-time favourite artists. So... I've been, I drew that with the slip. Rather than using paints and pencils, I just put it on a chopstick and drew with the chopstick and the slip. So I'm experimenting with that whole concept of trying to draw with slip. Um, It's working, I guess, you know. Um, It's a lot of fun. So I'm just using, again, using this as my canvas and not using a paintbrush but and flicking. I put my hand in the Limoges slip. It feels great, by the way, Sean. Great slip. And then I just flick it onto my pieces and I get amazing results. A lot of fun. Do you have to process that slip uh, yourself? I I buy it. I buy it already made. I buy it already made. So, you know, just put my hand in and then just do my movements and use my hands and my fingers because what happens is the Limoges drips beautifully. So I use my fingers when it's dripping and I'm, I'm doing circles on my pieces. Um, I, can, I have a lot of control. It's, it sounds like I don't have any control, but I do have control. And um, I can do all sorts of things by dripping this. So I use my fingers to drip it. I use, uh, I flick it. I use a very fine chopstick to draw with. It's a lot of fun. I'm enjoying that new pathway. Sounds like you're a bit of a Jackson Pollock of ceramics. That would be nice. <laughs> that would be nice. Thank you. I'll well, take that. I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, yeah, I have to wait for that million dollar check, but um <laughs> Yes, well, let's see. Uh so that slip is is it um Limoges. So is the Limoges is that the name of the slip or the name of the technique? No, the Limoges it, that's just the French porcelain. The Limoges porcelain. In the ah, they used to make okay. Limoges porcelain was what the top cups used to make, be made from. I think you can still buy Limoges. Um, I'm probably pronouncing it wrongly, Sean, so that's probably why. So the, your, um, your clay body then, like not the slip, your clay body, 
would be like a, a Limoges clay. So it would be an imported clay. Yes. Yes. Ah. Yeah. It's a French. It's a French clay. They they make the Limoges slip from the French clay. Ah, that's, I'm that's, assuming that's the case because that's what they told me. That's interesting. That's probably why I haven't heard it because I've primarily been working with Australian clays and American and uh, a few different uh, overseas bodies clays over in Asia. But um, yeah, wow, the, yeah, the um, the, it's the, expensive. Yeah, yeah. I have heard. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure of this, but I have heard a lot of the European clay bodies are very sensitive to uh, hydration of water. They, they can't take a lot, a lot of water, uh, and they just break down. Is is that? Do you find that the case with the porcelain, or does it uh, behave sort of fairly, fairly well? I think it's okay. I find that um, the I also use uh, Lumina, right? Um, and I find that one is uh, very sensitive to the amount of water you put into it, and um, things can just go whoosh. Yes, when you've got too much water. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I think that um, shows a lot of um, skill between um, people starting off in ceramics and then those more advanced in years uh, with the amount, amount of water that they use. <laughs> exactly. Look, there are ceramic artists, as you know, that use no water and throw a beautiful bowl. Well, I'd like to get there one day. One day, one day. <laughs> one day, one day. In the very distant future, Sean. Yeah. Okay. As long as, we, as, long as, as long as it's there on our goal list and it's, it will be slowly taking each step towards it, it's okay. Um, okay, so... Moving on, if someone wanted to actually go um, into the art industry or particularly into ceramics, what sort of advice would you give them? Do you do you do you have uh, any recommendations or advice starting off? Or I I as I said, I actually was introduced to it by sheer chance. Yes, and I think the best thing I did was go to TAFE, um, Brookvale TAFE. I have to mention them are amazing. They have got incredible facilities, an incredible kiln room, and great teachers, really great teachers. Um, I think it's important to have teachers that are passionate about ceramics. Um, The head teacher at Brookvale is Chris James. He has been instrumental in the success of Brookvale TAFE, and um, he is a passionate um, ceramic artist, um, I don't know if he calls himself a ceramic artist. I call him a ceramic artist. He probably has a different name. But um, Chris is very encouraging and it's it's a way, I think you have to, if you really want to learn, and I think if you don't go to something formal, you can do it yourself. Like you can buy a wheel, as we said, and practice. But I think you'll never get all the skills. You'll never get all the tips that you need. I think you just need to learn certain techniques and certain skills. Um, It's like, you know, people go to masters in Japan and, you know, how long it takes to do that. And a master spends how long? I mean, you know that better than I do. The years it takes to master one piece. Um, Mm. So for me, I think it is, that's just my opinion. I think you do need some formal training if you want to get ahead. Yeah, that, I agree 100%. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, on our own, we can only pr- progress so much. Uh, I think it's not just ceramics, but so many different fields within and also outside art industries, whether we're doing trade trades or careers, you know, to progress within anything, we definitely need someone else to mentor us and help us to pick up uh, good habits and good skills, not bad habits and bad skills. <laughs> exactly. And that's it. You, you've hit it on, that's right, you've hit the nail yeah. on the head. Bad, bad habits, you develop yourself. And good habits, you are kind of wrapped on the knuckle and someone says, just a minute, that is not a good way to pull. You do use the wrong hand and, and so on. And you And you learn, and you learn that way. Do you have a particular... <laughs> Um, uh, artwork um, that sort of has inspired you or someone or an artist that you look up to 
uh, that sort of gives you uh, inspiration and motivation for your work? I probably admire Giacometti, Alberto Giacometti. He was an all-round artist. Alberto Giacometti um, drew, painted, sculpted, and he was never content with anything he ever did because he always felt that it wasn't good enough. So he always pushed himself even further. But I love his work. I love his drawings. I love his sculptures. And the one I showed you was my homage to Giacometti. And it's it's someone that I've always liked, uh, probably because he was an all-rounder. Hmm. Are you much of a... Are you much of a book person, Dana? Very much so. Yeah, I'm a I'm a great reader. I love reading. Absolutely. Do you, Do you have any recommendations of any uh, books? One of my all time favorite books, and it's probably not anyone's. I mean, I I it's a book about. It's called A Rage to Live, and it's the romance or the meeting of. So Richard Burton and Isabel Burton, the explorer, Richard Burton. Mm. It's an incredible read. It's um, You learn about Sir Richard Burton. He was the man who discovered the source of the Nile, but, again, uh, a character that doesn't exist any longer in this society. He spoke about 27 languages, wow. um, Arabic wow. languages, and he explored he was an incredible man all around and his wife equally incredible. So it's a story that I've read and reread and reread. So, you know, that's my go-to when I want to read. But I, I love the Russian classics, of course, because I, I studied them and I'm very passionate about Dostoevsky and, um, and Tolstoy and all of them. What's that called again? A Rage to? A Rage to Live. A Rage to Live. Okay, I'll have to look that one up, definitely. Let me know what you think if you actually get around to, to seeing it. It's it's quite a hefty book, I have to say, but um, for me it was well worth reading. And anything, I mean, I've read a lot of about Richard Burton, so Richard Burton. Yeah, I have a stead- steadily growing library and um, I am interested also in uh, non-ceramic books as well. And, um, uh, Janet Debus gave me a couple of good recommendations to look into and then yeah I'll definitely have a look into that one if, for sure uh with um someone in ceramics because people often f- trying to find ceramics books as well uh and there are millions of different ceramic books do you have any um ones that stick out that you found useful you mean instructional ones or uh, ones that um, might have helped you uh, with glazes or with um learning some tips or techniques in the studio um, or particular might be a coffee table book of a um, artist, uh, <laughs> uh, any type of um, ceramic books. Uh, I happened to be in the Canberra um, Art Gallery not long ago when that, that window of opportunity, short window of opportunity to go into Canberra and come back out again in COVID, and I bought the Greg Daly book, which was the glaze book. So, But I'm still going through it. Um, I have... Because I love books, a bit like you, I've actually got quite a collection of ceramic books. Um, and I don't think there's one particular one. I really like to flick through through all of uh, I'm not a great glazer. Um, I'm, that's, that's where I want to go. That's my next step. I want to learn more about glazing. I need to do less drawing and painting, more glazing. And that's where I, I am going to head. Do you reckon you'll have anyone teaching any um, glaze tech classes at your new studio? No, I think for that you really do not need to go to a master. And I I will probably continue going to an open studio at Brookvale because Chris James is amazing when it comes to glazes. So that's something that I, I will continue doing, even though I'll have my own studio it, I will continue open studio at Brookvale one day a week. Um, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful facility. Awesome, awesome. 
Uh, on your uh, CV, you're quite regular in ex- exhibiting in both the Mosman Gallery and also the uh, uh, Kerry Low Gallery. Uh, do you st- do you have any plans to k- k- keep continuing exib- exhibiting in those areas, or will you be focusing more on the business side of things with with this new um, what's it called Crackpot 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 Gal- Crackpot. <laughs> Crackpot Gallery. <laughs> Crackpot. Crackpot Gallery. Uh, now, I will continue to exhibit in other places as well. Um, I have a piece in Kerry's, I had a piece in her last exhibition. Uh, I really also want to support other galleries. You know, it's not just about our gallery. I want to support other galleries. And I think that's one way of doing it in exhibiting. I've been very fortunate because last year uh, I was invited as one of nine artists to to um choose a decade at the Manly Gallery and I chose the 50s, which was a beach culture, and I created Little Surfers and Lifesavers. Um, they, I had them for a month in Manly Gallery and then they invited me to stay on. So I'm actually a regular. Um, they call them designers. I don't know why they call them designers. But I'm a, I'm a regular designer at Manly Gallery now, which was really, really nice. That's a nice title so, to have. Yeah, so absolutely. Look, I, I will continue. If people want to have my work in their gallery, I, I will definitely be doing that. Beautiful. That's awesome. Uh, it's good to have have your toes in the water and to spread out into many different niches and fields. Um, with, with the whole thing from last year with um, when COVID hit, did that, did that affect your uh, arts practice or the business sides of things? business side of things in your practice or do you feel that you weren't really affected? Uh, what what happened there when that hit? It affected me in so far that um, I had a really good year last year in terms of being selected. So I was a finalist in four really top, what we call top um, ceramic um, exhibitions. And then Manly I had, I was the the artist for all of June. So Unfortunately, it meant that I couldn't go to any of the openings because they didn't exist. So that happened. So, and then nobody else could go. So a lot of people didn't get to see the work that was um, on display. Manly Gallery suffered quite a lot. Well, we don't have international um, guests because Manly Gallery does rely quite heavily on international visitors or national visitors. So um, there were very few people going through the gallery that whole year. Um, I think, and, and other galleries as well, it was the same thing. And, you know, with COVID, a lot of them shut down. So Manly Gallery was actually shut down for quite a long time. Um, I, again, I think that uh, the gods, the kiln gods or some glazed gods were looking down on me because my month was June. The gallery opened on the 1st of June. Nice. So, uh, again, you know, very, very lucky, very blessed, I guess, from that point of view. But there were very few people going through the doors. Even though it was open, there were very few people going through the doors. So it's it's coming back very, very slowly. Um, but it didn't really, I mean, I continued making. I continued making and I make every day. And I, I, if I'm at home, I sit in my chair and I may have the TV on or music and, and I'm making something. I could be making a little person. I could be making something. I'm always making I'm, I'm, you know, never sitting down and not making something because I, I just need to touch clay, I guess. Yes. Uh, yes. I think most creative people are a bit bit like that, um, especially artists. They definitely have to make something or they go insane. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. My husband will probably say if I didn't draw when I was painting and drawing, if I didn't draw for a while, he could tell. <laughs> I don't know if he's trying to say something, but uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's definitely it's definitely good to hear more about that. Uh, do you feel that um, things have recovered more this year or perked up this year? Um, did you do you feel that there's a change between last year and this year? Yes, absolutely. I think that the fact that um, exhibitions are, are now allowed to have certain number of people going and they're promoting it and but something good came out of all of that the online galleries I think it gave um, the wider audience an opportunity to see 
ceramic shows that they may not have gone to. So having these exhibitions online was a good thing and it forced galleries to create online sites. So I think that was a positive and I still think that's a positive and I'm hoping that they will continue that. I think that's a really nice thing to do. But, yes, I think it's picking up slowly. Um, I don't know if anyone's buying ceramics, but, you know, it's hard to tell. Yeah. It is. Oh, but um, as long as we keep on making, um, hopefully we can keep our sanity. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Awesome. We might round things up there. Um, if anyone wants to contact you, uh, I'm sure that they can contact you on your website and your Instagram page. Uh, Dana's Instagram page is Dana underscore Lundmark. That is D-A-N-A underscore L-U-N-D-M-A-R-K. That's Dana underscore Lundmark. Uh, you can also find her on her website, which is www.danalundmark.com. Uh, will your new exhibition, uh, sorry, your new gallery, uh, Crackpot Gallery, would that have a uh, new website as well? It does. It's got a website. It's actually www.crackpot.com.au. <laughs> and it has an Instagram. Sean, it also has an Instagram site. We, all this went up about two days ago. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're up there. Awesome. What's the uh, Instagram? Uh, Instagram thing? is Crackpot Studios and Gallery. Is that an A-N-D gallery or the symbol? A-N-D, A-N-D. Oh, okay. Crackpot A-N-D Studios and Gallery. Awesome. Crackpot, Crackpot Studios and Gallery, yes. Nice, nice. Okay, I'll, I'll have a look at that in uh, just a few minutes <laughs> after Thank we finish you. up. <laughs> awesome. Well, I w- definitely wish you the, the most luck and I'm sure it will definitely succeed. Um, and it's been a pleasure introducing you to the world here today. Uh, I'm sure things will continue to go well. Uh, well, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Dan- Dana Lundmark. Thank you, Sean. And I've, I've really enjoyed our chat. It was lovely to see you again after all these years. So maybe down in Sydney and visit our gallery with your work, Sean. Yeah, I'll bring the kids and keep them away from knocking anything over. Ah, <laughs> uh, Look, I'm sure we can manage that. Awesome. Thank you again. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.